All right. Happy places. Man, a lot of people, my house, my sunroom, my lake, my lake, uh, my home, my home, North Point Marina, my porch. Man, my happy place is anywhere where my wife is. I just want to eat lunch today. <laughs> Are you kidding me? All right. Anyway, so uh, my name is Tim Bycroft. I am glad that you guys are with us today. We've been in a kind of a summer series, if you will, uh, just talking about the promises of God. And where this came from was I was talking with a lot of different people. And, you know, sometimes we wonder if God hears our prayers. We may pray and pray and pray, and it doesn't seem like God answers our prayers. And, and so one of my common responses is, have you actually prayed what God has promised? I mean, if you want to see God answer a prayer, then maybe the prayer that you should ask is something that he has promised. Doesn't that make sense? And so that got me thinking is, do we know the promises of God? Now, there's over 7,000 promises that God has given us throughout the scriptures. I didn't necessarily count each one, but Google helped me out with that number. Anyway, um, there's a lot of them. And so what I thought was over this, over this summer that we would look over some of the promises some of the main promises that God has given us. Because I think this, that if we can understand the promises of God and we look for those promises of God, I think those can be an, an amazing blessing in our life. <coughs> Excuse me, number one. And number two is to know that these promises aren't necessarily just for here on this earth, but they last through out eternity. And so I think it's a great blessing, a great gift for us to know the promises of God. As a matter of fact, Peter mentions this. He says this in his um, second letter. He says this, and, and, and because of his glory and excellence, he has given us a great and precious promise. He's given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruptions caused by human desires. In other words, God's promises connect us with him. They help us to be removed further from the world and its corruption and the sin and, and the depression and the anxiety and the worries and the cares that come with us. So I think that's an amazing gift that God gives us. So this weekend, what I want to talk about is this amazing promise of God's personal peace in your life. Okay? Because let's just start off and go like this. Let's just ask this question. How many of you just would love to have just a little bit more peace in your life than worry and anxiety and cares and everything else, right? All of us, to some degree or another. All of us want what this is promise of peace is. And the Bible talks a lot about the promises of God's peace. As a matter of fact, Isaiah says this, Isaiah 54, 10. He says, though the mountains may be shaken and the hills removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord Almighty, who has compassion for each one of us. That's the power of God's peace. It's a promise of God's peace. And so if we're going to spend time together talking about uh, uh, today, I, I think we should talk about how to enjoy this peace that God promises us, how to live it out in our daily lives, and how do we receive it? How do we access this peace that God promises? So let's first talk about what is God's peace, okay? Let's talk about what God's peace may look like because for many of us, myself included, when we think peace, we think of this kind of perfect calmness in our state of mind, right? Or, or we may think of the perfect circumstances that are taking place in our lives, right? Well, peace is, that's not peace, that's vacation, okay? And, and vacation's great, and I hope that you all had a, a time to get vacation in the summer, but God wants to do something different. The kind of peace that want, God wants to give us looks something like this. When I'm not on vacation, <laughs> When my circumstances aren't great, when my peace of mind is not where it should be, when my emotional state is kind of a wreck, God's peace is still there. Even though my circumstances may change and may not necessarily be great, God's peace is there. Because sometimes what we do is we think peace is the absence of something, right? Uh, let me, uh, absence of noise or 
absence of struggles or absence of conflict or absence of that one person that came to mind when I said there's no peace. And you know who I'm talking about. They came to mind just like that, right? Okay? God's peace is just the opposite. It's not the absence. It's, it's the full indwelling of his presence in your life. It's not the absence of conflict or circumstances or, or the struggles of life or the trials of life or that one person that you know came to mind. It's not the absence of that. It's the full presence of God in your life. <clears throat> giving us strength and security. Now, I get it. It's very easy to equate God's peace with circumstances, myself included. There's an inner calm that takes place many times with certain circumstances. And there's other times in my life where circumstances get my blood pressure up just a lot. <laughs> I mean, think about it. How many of you go to work and you've had a long day. You're going to work and you have that job that you have to do or you have to do it with that, you know, that one person again. It's a 10 hour day and by the end of the day, your blood pressure is way up here, right? And then you jump on the 294 and you have to drive home and the construction is going on and it's bumper to bumper traffic and now the blood pressure is a little bit more up here. And you know that you have a birthday party coming up for your three-year-old, and there's going to be 27 three-year-olds running around your house, and your blood pressure now just skyrockets through the roof. Versus, where's your happy place? We, we asked you to think about your happy place earlier. Where is your happy place? Is it the beach? Is it that mountain lake? Or is, it, uh, is it that jacuzzi that you can slip into that's just set at just the right temperature for you, Right? What is it? Where, where is your happy place? Because circumstances do change, like, like even your blood pressure, right? It, it changes how you feel about things. So our circumstances do create a sense of calm in our life. There's no doubt about that. But it's different than the peace that God brings us, okay? I, I just want to differentiate between the fact that circumstances can bring some calm to our lives but that's not the peace that God gives us. It's different than that. God promises a kind of peace that's not at the mercy, let me say it this way, it's not at the mercy of our circumstances. His peace is different. Think about it this way. If God's peace can't be there in all aspects of our lives, then it's not really the promise. <clears throat> it's not really his promise of peace it's the promise that he will change our circumstances. And, and, and can I just tell you this? Because this is where some people kind of fall off the tracks, especially in the church or with Christianity is, they think that God's going to always change our circumstances. Can I just tell you, that's not a biblical principle? <laughs> that God doesn't necessarily, can he change our circumstances? Absolutely. Does he sometimes change our circumstances? Yes, sometimes he does. But it's not a promise that he will. But here's the promise. That no matter what the circumstances are, his peace will be there. His promise of peace, his, his presence will be with you. God's presence in your situation. Because when you understand this, God's presence in your life is a powerful, powerful thing. It's greater than any of your circumstances. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's even greater than your emotional state. God's peace is greater than your emotional state. No matter what you're going through in the middle of the emotional storms that you're facing, God's peace and presence is greater. God says, I want you to have my peace when your life is falling apart. Because it's going to at some point, to some degree or another. We know this. I'm going to give you the kind of peace that is there even in the midst of the storms of life. Because we know the storms of life come, don't they? <laughs> We're not exempt from it. It happens. It happens to all of us to some degree or another in all of our lives. So, that seems like a downer, but I want to turn this around. How do we get the promise of God's peace? How do you find, experience, and enjoy God's peace? So let's talk about that today. 
And the first thing that I think we have to understand is this. That if you want this supernatural, God-given peace, the very first thing that we need to do is make peace with the peacemaker. (laughs) Doesn't that make sense? That we need to make peace with God. It it starts with people making peace with God. You you can't think that you're going to have peace with the peacemaker if you don't have peace with him first. Romans 5, 1 says this, Paul says this. He says, therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. So let's talk about this for just a second. Let's unpack that. Let's just get down to the nitty gritty of what I'm talking about this morning, which is this, that God is the peacemaker. God is the creator. God is the one who has created us good, but the things fell apart, didn't it? That all of us have sinned to some degree or another, and that sin has separated us from our creator, from the peacemaker. There's a separation. And the Bible is very clear that this sin issue that we have between us and God, it's, 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 it's create a separation between us and God. And we need to make peace with God, right? Well, we know this. Some of you shake your head and say, yes, I get this. I understand. Okay. However, the words that I just used there, what I have found are false. Let me unpack that for just a second. Because I don't know about you, but I always thought I need to make peace with God. And so what I would do is, man, I would go to church like a good boy, read my Bible like a good boy. I try to figure out the best prayers to pray. I try to do all the right things. In other words, to make peace with God, I would do what many people think is I try not to do bad things and I've tried to just do good things. I try just to be kind. And then, obviously, I'd be at peace with the creator of all things, with God. And so I was just hoping, if you will, that this was going to work out. And I would do all these things to make peace with God. And what I found out was I was wrong. Here's why. The truth is, you and I don't have the capability of making peace with God. (laughs) Luckily, he's got the capabilities of making peace with us. Okay? It's not us who make peace with God. God is the one who decided to make peace with us. He took the first step. He was the one who initiated it through Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.20 says this, God made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. There's the promise. We're talking about God's promises. Here's one right here. God promised. God made a promise, a peace with us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Anybody agree with this? Just me talking? Okay. Because that's some really good news right there. Okay. Okay. I'm separated from God. He created me to be good. I've done evil. Our sins have separated us from us and the creator. Therefore, we've earned a death sentence. And some of you, when you hear that, that creates conflict between you and God right there. Doesn't it? When I say things like that. Your sins have separated from God. And the separation from God earns you an eternal death sentence. And some of you are sitting here going... Well, if that's the kind of God you serve, I don't want anything to do with it. But let me, let me just explain this for just a second. God's unconditional love for you, is he's saying, listen, I don't want that to happen. I love you too much. I care about you too much. You see, Jesus died on the cross to take away that death penalty for you and for me. And it's not just a love story. No, when, when, when Jesus died, he paid the penalty for the wrongs that you and I have done. Jesus says, I'll pay the penalty. I'll pay the price. I'll remove the penalty. I'll remove the separation by dying for you on the cross. I want to give you this gift of forgiveness that only I can give and be the peacemaker between you and God. I'm going to make peace with you and God. I'm going to to take the first step. And you realize that the only thing that we have to do, we do have a part in this which is simply this. Jesus Christ is standing there begging you to please accept it. Accept it. Here's the gift. 
It's an amazing gift of peace that I've, that I've made between you and the creator. Just, just receive the gift. I'm begging you to take the gift. I, I, I died so that you could receive this gift. Please take it. Right? If you're not sure that you've ever received that kind of peace with God, be sure today. Seek me out today. Let's talk about that. Because it's not based on what you do or do not do. You, you don't make peace with God. God made peace with you. The only thing that you have to do is receive it. To confess your need for him. To believe in it. And to receive it. Amen. It's an extremely powerful thing to recognize. Right? When you, when you know that you and God. Think about this. How powerful is that? How powerful is that to know that you've made peace with the God of creation? How powerful is that when you know that you've made peace with the peacemaker? How powerful is that that you know that you didn't have to die to receive God's grace and love and unconditional forgiveness? How powerful is that? And to know that when you've made peace with God, you've made peace with the peacemaker. That's powerful stuff, isn't it? So that leads me to the next point. Once I've made peace with God, the second thing is, and I'm going to get real practical. I've got two points that I want you to understand. Number one, we need to make peace with the peacemaker, with God. But I'm going to get real practical with these next two points, okay? Because I think sometimes, <laughs> I don't know about you, but sometimes I just need the Mr. Obvious show in my life. And so I'm just going to talk about some things that sometimes we can just get so caught up in the, in, in the world and chasing things and, and we miss the obvious. And the first one is this. Sometimes we just need to let the peace know, maker know, <laughs> the peace giver know, <laughs> we need your peace, man. God, we need your peace. When was the last time that you just let God know what you needed? You know? When it comes to enjoying God's peace, um, God kind of writes a prescription for us. There's, when, when you read scripture, there's basically two different ways that you can receive the information. Number one, some of the passages of scripture are what we call prescriptive. It's prescriptive writing. Other writing is descriptive writing, okay? Here, I'm gonna give you a prescription. It's almost like God has gotten out his doctor pad, prescription pad, and going, here. Here's how you receive peace. Take this to the bank. Okay? God has given us a prescription. And here it is. Starting in Philippians 4, 4, Paul writes this. Rejoice in the Lord always. <laughs> Does anybody else read that and go, yeah, right. Have you seen my life? Rejoice in the Lord. What's that next word? Always. Does it say rejoice in the Lord when things are going right for you? Does it say rejoice in the Lord when it's just, you know, Labor Day weekend and you've got big plans and you're going to be hanging out with friends and family and everything's going to go just right? Because you know when you're hanging out with friends and family, everything is just smooth. Now it says rejoice in the Lord always. And then it says again, rejoice. Let your gentleness, gentleness be evident to all that the Lord is near. Verse 6. <laughs> Do not be anxious about anything. I think Paul must have got hit by, you know, in the head. What? This doesn't... Don't be anxious about anything. Does anybody relate to that? You're just like, man, I'm just calm all the time. Okay? Now... Don't be anxious about it, but in every situation. Now, here it is. Watch this. By prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God. When anxiety and worry and cares of this world, when things are happening that steal your joy, that are making you anxious, when making you worry, pray, petition God, thank God for what he's already doing and present your request to God. Verse 7, here's the promise. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's the promise. 
The promise is God's peace. And what this says is, it's a supernatural peace that you can't receive anywhere on this earth. As a matter of fact, I would dare say that it's going to be a struggle for me to describe the peace that God can give you because the only way that I think that you can know what I'm talking about because there's nowhere else on this earth is that you've received God's peace in the past. How many of you would sit here today and go, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've received God's peace at some point, right? See the hands that are going up? I'm telling you, there is a supernatural peace that happens in the midst of the storm that you're like, where did that come from? It just comes out because you can't do it on your own. God will guard your hearts and your mind. There's a principle of anything and there's a principle of everything that are kind of connected in this passage. How many, let, me, let me talk about this. Don't worry about anything, okay? But pray about everything. Don't worry about anything and pray about everything. Now, I don't know about you, but I've got those two mixed up sometimes. I worry about everything, and sometimes I don't pray about anything, right? And it's so easy to do, okay? Then, of course, we don't have God's peace when that happens. And we wonder, hey, how come I've never experienced God's peace? Well, have you asked for it? Have you actually prayed for it? When, when something is happening, do you stop and pray? Because here's the prescription. God says, tell me your needs, thank him for the answers, and you'll experience his peace. Now, there's all kinds of places in the Bible that, <clears throat> that talk about prayer. But in this one, it deals specifically with the prescription of how we can deal with anxieties and worries and cares and things that are going on in our lives. God's peace in my life. God, I need it. But have you verbalized that to God? Have you actually prayed, God, I need your peace right now? Sometimes we wait until it gets bad, right? You're kind of like me. You're kind of dense until the two by four hits you upside the head. You forget to do things. And sometimes I do that all the time. I wait until I'm in the middle of the storm to start praying. And what I will tell you is this. What I have learned is, it's much better to be proactive in our prayer life than to be reactive. So I would say this, maybe life is going great for you right now. Maybe this sermon isn't for you. Maybe you're thinking, man, I am just coasting, God is good, we're, we're just tight, we're together, nothing's happening in my life, and so you're just sitting here going, ah, whatever. Let me tell you something, you're either coming out of the storm, in the middle of a storm, or getting ready to go into a storm in life. My suggestion is be proactive and start praying right now for God's peace for when you're heading into a storm. It, it may keep us from going into things that we wish we hadn't have gone into. It, it may keep us from going into certain, have you ever thought about that? Being proactive with your prayer life might keep you from going into stupid situations and circumstances that you don't want to go into. Being proactive it says that God will guard our hearts and our minds. It's kind of like putting a guard at the door. <clears throat> you ever thought about this? Maybe there's things that are happening in the neighborhood. Maybe there's break-ins that are taking place in the neighborhood. And, and so you're like, man, we should probably put in a security system. Right? We, we should probably put in a security system because that would be good, you know? Have a little sign out front because that's really going to stop somebody from coming in and... <laughs> Right? And so we put this sign and all these little electronic devices on our windows. But what if we, we, we talk about doing it, but we never do it? And then all of a sudden we hear somebody trying to break in our house, right? And then we're going to call ADT and say, hey, can you come in? It's too late, right? Be proactive. It's the same thing. Be proactive. Guard your heart and your life and your minds by prayer. One of the most common prayers in the Bible is asking for God's peace. As a matter of fact, there's 23 times in the New Testament where it talks about praying for God's peace, the promise of God's peace. As a matter of fact, Paul starts a lot of his letters to the churches with this prayer of peace. As a matter of fact, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 is a great example. It says, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace all the time in, in every way. That's a very proactive way of praying for one another, isn't it? Okay? So you pray. God, give me your peace. In all circumstances, in all times of my life. 
So you make that request. Let God know what you need. And many times it is, God, I just need your peace. Because again, we can pray God take us out of this circumstance, and maybe he will. And it's not wrong to pray that. But I guarantee you this, here's the promise. If you would pray for God's peace in the middle of the circumstance, his promise is, I will bring peace. And you plus God is all you need to make it through anything. So make peace with the peacemaker. Make peace with God. Make your request known to him. And here's the third thing. When when life seems to be handing you troubles and worries and anxiety, instead of focusing on those things, I think we need to focus our thoughts on Jesus. Isn't that very practical? (laughs) But it's not always the easiest thing to do, is it? You know, God can, God can even work through, hear, hear me on this. Some of you need to hear this this morning. When you're, God can even work through when you're working through the middle of negative emotions. God can work through your emotions. Jesus is a perfect example of this. Sometimes we think of Jesus, you know, he's the perfect person, and he was. So he must have had perfect peace all the time. He was probably just like, he's just, you know, he, he was just even keel all the time. No, God, have, you ever, have you ever read Jesus? This dude was an emotional dude. He, he really was. He had strong emotions. As a matter of fact, sometimes he got angry. He got angry with the religious leaders for what they were doing to the people. Sometimes he, he, he got disappointed with his disciples. You, could, you just kind of hear the irritation in his voice. With people just not getting it, who he was. Sometimes he was pressured. How many of you remember the story before Jesus is going to go to the cross the next day? And he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and praying. Do you don't think he wasn't pressured at that time? You don't think he was anxious at that moment? It says that he was sweating. And, and he was sweating so profusely. He was, he was so engaged with what was going on in his life that, that blood was coming out. In his sweat. I mean, that's, that's pressure, man. And Jesus was experiencing that. Jesus felt great emotion, yet in the middle of all of these emotions that he was going on, Jesus still enjoyed the presence of God's peace in his life. That's the example that Jesus shows us. We don't need to necessarily stress out to enjoy God's peace. We can have his peace in the middle of our stress. God does not always change our circumstances, but he does change our focus. And our focus should be focused on Jesus. Jesus' circumstances, think about this. Jesus is praying and it says that God came and attended him in the garden. And that's when he was just like, okay, God, whatever, I will do your will. And at that point, God attended him all the way to the cross to death. You see, Jesus' circumstances didn't change, right? But God was with him the entire time to bring his peace. Colossians 3.15 is another verse. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule your heart. 2 Corinthians 10.5. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to what? Our circumstances. No, that's not what it says. We take captive our thought and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. We take every thought captive <clears throat> and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Does anybody else struggle with that? See, I might be going through something in life. Maybe it's circumstantial stress. Maybe it's relational stress. <clears throat> And here's what happens. I'm going through some kind of relational stress. Somebody's stressing me out, okay? Something has happened. I said something they didn't like or, or they said something that I didn't like or they did something, I did something, whatever. And, and all of a sudden, we've got tension. And here's what happens. I don't know about you, but this is what happens to me. About 2 o'clock in the morning, I wake up because I've been dreaming about this already. All of a sudden, all, all of a sudden I start this imaginary conversation that's actually never going to take place with that person. 
And for the next hour, two hours, that's all I can think about. This is what I would have said. This is what I'm going to say. This is how I'm going to get back. This is what I'm going to, you know. And this is how I should have dealt with this. And this is how I'm going to deal with this. If I ever see that person again, please do it, right? Two hours. And you realize that all that has done is caused more stress on me and not necessarily that person. And all of a sudden, I've lost two hours of sleep that's going to affect my next day and how I deal with my wife and my kids and my job. And <clears throat> When really all I should have done was waking up, felt that stress, and just started praying, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. Right now, I need your peace and not this stress. Think about Jesus, focus on Jesus, focus on Jesus, focus on Jesus. And you know what? Here's what I've learned is if I can do that, next thing you know, I'm falling asleep while I'm praying. Which is a great way to go to sleep, by the way. So let me ask this question. Who or what is controlling your mind? Who or what is controlling your mind? Is it fear? Man, here we go again. I knew this was going to happen. I, I, I knew this was going to happen again in my life. It, it seems like it always does. And fear starts to take control. You know, now I've got to work through this. It's all up to me. If it's not me, who's going to do it? I got to make this happen. And stress and stress and stress and stress how you're going to do this. Or is Jesus con controlling your mind? <laughs> In other words, when things start to happen, Jesus, you're going to walk with me through this, man. I know this. Jesus... I don't care what happens. I know that you have a purpose and a plan for me, even in the midst of the things that are going on. Jesus, I know that you can bring hope and peace and, and, and the promise of your presence. Jesus, I, I don't care what anybody else says about me. I know what you say about me. Who's going to control my soul? Is it going to be fear? Is it going to be others? Or is it going to be Jesus? Jesus. What, am I, what I'm saying is, is you, you've got to ask yourself, what am I focusing on in life that's distracting me from the peace of God? Is it your worries? Is it your friends? Is it your enemies? Is it your coworkers? Is it your circumstances? Is it your ex? Is it your job? Is it your 401k? Is it your feelings? Is it your emotions? Man, I'm here to tell you something when you take all of those different things that can just consume us and what happens is the mind starts racing and you're consumed with all these things and stress starts happening and then anxiety starts happening and worry starts happening and what happens out of all those things when they compound is it's anger turned inwards at some point and you just come become depressed. And then you don't want to do anything. Lay in bed not talk with anybody. Don't even want to talk with God, really. It's hard to be pulled out. How do I know this? I've dealt with it. I deal with it. And here's what I've learned, my friends. When the mind starts spiraling, when things start controlling you other than the Holy Spirit, you will spiral to places you don't want to spiral to. So focus this. Okay? Take captive those thoughts and make them obedient to Jesus. Focus on Jesus. And that's where the peace of God comes into my life. Focus on Jesus and listen to what he tells you. Jesus said this. Listen, I've told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. Jesus says that in me, you may have peace. In this world, he says this. He's like, oh, great. In this world, you will have troubles. But listen to me. I've overcome this world. And that's the promise. That's the power of this peace. That any of the circumstances, any of the feelings that I have, that's why he's able to give us peace in any circumstances because he's overcome the world. Peace means that you know God is in control 
that God will prevail in the end and that you feel his presence in the midst of whatever you're suffering. So as the band has missed their cue, (laughs) I'm going to pray until they get out here. Because I'm done. I was done like five minutes ago, actually. I was like, so, anyway. Hey, man. Cue stage. God, we come before you right now, and uh, we thank you. We praise you. We give you honor and glory because you have been the one who has initiated the peace that we needed with you. God, in the midst of our pride and con- you know, battle for control, Lord, We have separated ourselves with you thinking that we can do life better. All of us have done that. We've fallen short of the standards that you've called us to be. And so, God, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask that you would come into our lives and and we confess our need for Jesus Christ right now. Whether we've done that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, or today is the day that we confess you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we want to have peace with you through your son, Jesus Christ. God, I also pray today. That if there are people here that have never asked you, never asked you for your peace in the midst of the sufferings, the trials, and the contentment of life, Lord, I pray that you would just, you would just pour, you would just lavish your peace upon them today. That there wouldn't be any doubt, that there would just be like this, this gust of your spirit that just blows your breath into their their soul today, where they experience your peace. God, I pray today that when the stresses of this world, when the things of this world just start mounting up and our minds start to swirl and our minds start to drift and our minds start to to go into places we don't even really want it to go. God, you would allow your spirit to just prompt us to think and focus on Jesus, to take captive those those thoughts and make them obedient to him. God, we thank you for your promise. We thank you for all the promises you've given us, but we especially thank you for the promise of your peace. And no matter what we're going through, your presence is more powerful. Thank you, God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.